So in this lesson, we are going to look at the uh, scientific method. The uh, learning intentions and the aim of this section, um, so this is the scientific method, is to look at, so we want to look at like define, so definitions and examples of areas of study incorporated by biology. So biology as a subject, like what kind of areas does biology cover uh, from a science point of view? So we're, we will look then at the process of the scientific method. So basically, how do biologists work? Like what's the what's the way that they work? Um, biologists like carry out experiments. So we're going to look at the principles of experimentation. We're also going to kind of talk uh, about the limitations of the scientific method. So it's not a perfect method. It has its uh, flaws and we look at the, the limitations of that. And we will look just from a practical point of view. So the process of the scientific method uh, should be developed as much as possible in all activities throughout the syllabus. So kind of like what we look at here is something that we will bring along with us all the way through to um, as we're doing practicals and as we're looking at other sections within biology. So biology is a science. It's a process. And that's what we want to kind of focus on now in this section of our learning. So as I say, these will be the sections that we will look at. So the first thing we want to talk about then is this uh, process of what's called the scientific method as an, as an ongoing process. So basically, this is like, you know, scientists. So scientists, like what way do they work? How does science work? So it's an actual process. So all kind of science, if you like, it starts with um, with this with, with curiosity, basically. So scientists are people who make observations in the world around them. So all science starts with observations. So what do I see? So for example, like what, what are the things that I can see in nature? Um, this can be from one's own experience, thoughts, or from reading. So generally, biology will start with some kind of observation. So it might be, for example, you might see some kind of an insect, for example, in your garden, and that's an observation. And then what you might start to do is to ask questions about it. So the next kind of process is when you make observations or when you become interested in something from a biological point of view, the next part then is to think of interesting questions. So you might have some questions that you want to answer about what it is that you're observing in the environment. So, so it, it might be some kind of a pattern or something that you, you see. So basically what you will do is you will devise questions about these observations that you're making. So it might be, for example, you could be in your garden and maybe you might be looking at, you might look at a leaf, for example, that's in the garden. So imagine you have a leaf, something like this. And so this is my very bad drawing of a leaf. And you might ask the question, you know, what is it, like why, what is it that gives the leaf its green color? So why is a leaf green? Okay, so that might be, for example, a question or an observation that a scientist make. And what they will do then is they will think of questions or ways. So, so why is it green? Um, they will think of uh, the questions that you could ask. So we, ha we start off basically with an observation and then we start off with a question. Then what scientists will do is they'll try to come up with like an educated guess. So they'll formulate what's known as a hypothesis. So what are the general causes of the phenomena I am wondering about? So basically you might come up with some hypothesis and say, you know, uh, plants or leaves are green because there's some kind of a chemical that's in the plants that make it green. Okay, or you might come up with some way, some kind of a hypothesis. Now a hypothesis is something that you can actually go and you can test or you can, you can figure out. So with the hypothesis then, and generally with hypothesis, you have what are known as if-then statements. So if-then statements. Um, so what you will do is you will develop what's known as a testable prediction, or you'll come up with some kind of prediction that you can go about and you can test. Um, the next part then will be to gather data and to test your prediction. So to come up with some kind of an experiment to test and see if you can gather data, for example, to answer the question that you've asked. So that's gathering data to test your predictions. And then what might happen then is after you've gathered data and you've done the test, 
what will happen is you might find that um, either your question has been answered or it has not been answered. So you will refine, alter and expand or reject your hypothesis. So what will happen is you might, for example, change your hypothesis and you might say, okay, it's not because there's a chemical that's in the in the plant that makes it green. It might be something got to do with the light that's shining on the plant. Okay, so what will happen is after you've carried out some kind of an experiment, you will generally come along and you might change your original hypothesis. So hypothesis is something that you can test and then you test it, you gather your data, and you look, you review the data, and then you might go back and refine your hypothesis and you might change the test and carry out some more tests. And eventually through this process, what will happen is over time, you might develop general theories about, um, you know, for example, why plants are green. So this is the this is a very high level overview, if you like, of what's known as the scientific method. And we will look at this in detail um, just in subsequent uh, as, as we move on through this lesson. So before we move on, what we want to do is we want to think about like what is biology and what exactly is it that biology actually studies? So if we have a look here at this diagram here, so I'll just take a second to have a look at it. So what we can see is that we can study nature or the world around us at different levels. So for example, this here, when we look at like the whole world as a biosphere, we're looking at it at a very, very high level. And then as we zoom down into sections of the planet, we are looking at ecosystems. And then within ecosystems, we might look at like communities of animals within the ecosystems. Then within those communities, we, we might look at specific uh, organisms, like for example, an elephant. And then we might look at that elephant in detail. And what, what biology does is it takes, for example, these elephants or these organisms and it breaks them up into parts. So we might start to look at the different organ systems that, that are made up. So for example, like the body system, then we might like focus on specific parts of the organism like bones. Then we might even go down into even more detail like and start to look at tissues, for example. And um, then we might look at like, what is it that makes up the tissues? They're made up of individual cells. And we might we'd study the cell and what are cells made up of? If you break them down, they're made up of individual molecules. And then what are molecules made up of? They're made up of atoms. Okay, so this is generally, so when, when you get down to this level, you're talking, you know, generally about chemistry. And um, whereas when you start to move up to this kind of higher level, like molecules and cells, we're starting to look at the area of what's called biology. So if we think about some of the sections then within biology and what like what areas of study are within biology. So anatomy is the study of the structure of organisms and their parts. So for example, if we were to take um, an organism like an elephant uh, and we were to look at its individual parts, like its, its circulatory system, its bone system, its um, breeding system, etc. So that is what's known as um, anatomy. So biochemistry, so bio meaning life and chemistry meaning chemistry, is the study of chemical processes that occur within living organisms. So for example, how does an elephant get its energy? It uses the process of respiration. And respiration is what's known as it, it's, it's biochemistry because you're looking at how individual molecules react with each other. So if you remember from your junior cert, so what is, so respiration, So respiration is basically glucose, which is C6H12O6. So that's the glucose that you get from your food. You breathe in oxygen, O2, and these react, for example, inside in the cells, and you get respiration. So what do you get? You get CO2, which is produced, plus um, H2O, which is water, plus energy. And this is the process of respiration. So what we have here is we have these biomolecules. So for example, glucose, oxygen, carbon dioxide, water, and energy. So this whole area of biochemistry, like you would study biochemical processes like this process here, which is very important in order for most of the living organisms on the planet to get their energy. So botany then is the study of plants. So you have animals and you have plants. So botany is where you study plants. Ecology is the relationship of organisms to one another and to their environment. So generally in ecology, you're looking at this, this portion here. 
So you're looking at populations, communities, and ecosystems. So evolution then is, and we'll look at this in detail as part of the course, is the way different kinds of living organisms are thought to have developed from earlier forms. So basically from an evolutionary point of view, all life started from one single organism. And then what happened is that organism started to evolve and it started to turn into different types of organisms over millions of years. And those, those organisms then what they done is they actually evolved into different types of organisms then as well. And you get this um, process of evolution that happens over millions of years. And biology evolution is where we study that process in detail and look at, you know, how, where did life come from? How did it start? And how has it evolved over, over a period of time? Genetics then is the study of hereditary in living organisms. So what does that mean? So if you take, for example, the different characteristics that you have, you've taken from your mother and your father, and uh, that where do you store that information for the, your characteristics? Like, for example, the type of earlobes that you have, your, the color of your hair, the color of your skin. This is all covered in what, what is known as genetics. So again, within biology, um, genetics will be studied. Then we have what's known as microbiology. So for example, you have all of these animals like, or, like elephants at the micro or the macro scale. But what you have is from a microbiology point of view, it's the study of microorganisms such as bacteria, fungi, and viruses. So for example, the, the bacteria that causes food poison is what's called E. coli. And it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a simple bacteria and it gets into your gut and it causes food poisoning you have things like uh, viruses so these are kind of strange organisms that basically can infect so they can infect the cells and cause disease and we're very familiar with the, what's with the coronavirus and then fungi then are these kind of similar their kind of their cell structure is similar to our cell structure as humans but if we think about fungi so think about something like a like a mushroom, for example. So mushrooms are what are known as fungi. So these are these microscopic organisms. So some of these you can see with your naked eye, like mushrooms, but things like viruses and E. coli, you have to look at them under a microscope to be able to see them. And then another big area within um, biology is zoology, and that's the study of animals. So for example, you might study lions or tigers or elephants, any types of animals basically would be uh, the area that's covered by zoology. So these are the sections, if you like, that biologists, so biologists work, there's different types of biologists that work in all of these different areas. So we want to kind of get back to this process of the scientific method. And this is important and you need to know this process as well. So you need to kind of summarize it down into a simple diagram that you can use and then you can talk about each section of the diagram. So the process of the scientific method. So a hypothesis is an educated guess to explain something that you have observed. Okay, so that's what's known as a hypothesis. An experiment is carried out to test the hypothesis. So somebody comes up with a hypothesis, they carry out an experiment to test the hypothesis. Uh, the information collected in the experiment is called data. So when you carry out the experiment, you'll get some kind of reading, for example, and you will record this data in tables. And then what you can do is you can make graphs out of the tables to analyze the data. So, so the information that you collect is called data. Analysis involves examining trends and patterns in the data to determine if the hypothesis is true. So sometimes what happens is you take the, inf the data that you've collected from your experiment and you might make a, a graph, for example, and that allows you to analyze the data and see is your hypothesis true or false. So a theory is an, ex is an explanation of an observation made by results of experiments. So basically, if something, if you can continually test something and find that you get a specific result every time, then that test indicates that like the hypothesis becomes something stronger than just a hypothesis or a guess, but it becomes what's known as a theory, for example. A scientific law is formed when a theory has been shown to be true for a long time. So basically, the way that science works is if I come up with an explanation for something, scientists all around the world will try to prove why my explanation is not correct. And if they cannot prove that it's not correct, or if they cannot show that it's not correct, and I can show that it is correct by experimentation, then generally it 
goes from what's known as a theory into a scientific law. Now, scientists work within communities, and what scientists do is when they carry out all of this experimentation, uh, they usually publish the results and conclusions of their investigations in scientific journals. So one particular journal that's very popular in the biology field is this journal called Nature. So it's a very respected journal. And basically, it's like a, it's like a message board, if you like, or a central place where experts uh, within biology, they can publish their like what they're working on and their results and other scientists then can scrutinize or look at what they're doing and see you know whether it, it basically allows them to share their ideas and to communicate their ideas to other people that are interested in their ideas and generally they use uh, scientific what are called scientific journals so in order for my theory to get to be accepted it has to be published in a scientific journal and that journal is reviewed by experts who will decide whether my theory is has some merit or whether it's um it's not basically it's it's false basically okay so that's that's where it comes from so this is the process of the scientific method so a big part of biology is what is known as experimentation so in order and that's basically carrying out experiments so Experiments are repeated or replicated a number of times to make sure that the results are correct. So when we carry out an experiment, we don't just do it once. We carry out we carry it out a number we repeat it a number of times, um, and multiple measurements allows averages to be calculated, which minimizes the effect of small errors. So data can be presented in a table form or a chart form. So basically. When you carry out a measurement, for example, you don't just do one measurement because if you do one measurement and if you make a mistake when you're doing that measurement, then and if you just take that information, then there's there can be a high probability that you could make a mistake and then your results are wrong. So what would happen is repeatability. You do it maybe three times. You carry out your. So you would do your. Um, your test three times and or you could even do it a lot more and then you get the average of that. And that just helps to minimize error. So that's very, very important, a very important principle in relation to experimentation. So you would have, when you're generally, when you're carrying out experiments, you'd have large sample sizes, reduce the effects of error uh, from a single sample. So if you were, for example, you wanted to find out, um, let's say within Roscommon, County Roscommon, so you wanted to find out, for example, like what's the most common bird that lives in County Roscommon. So what you would have to do is you would have to like observe many different spots around County Roscommon, identify uh, the most common like birds that are around. And what you would do then is you wouldn't just go to one spot and okay, make your observations. It might be easy just to go to one spot and do that, but the sample size would be too small. So what you'd have to do is take a number, you go to a number of different spots, make your observations, count the types of birds that are present within those places. And then that gives you a better, a more truer picture of the types of birds that are around in the particular environment. So within science then, within experiments, then you have what's known as a control. So a control is used as a, as a comparison with the results of an experiment. So as a simple example, if you want to, let's say if you wanted to see uh, if you take the boiling point of water, so the boiling point of water, so it's 100 degrees, okay? So let's say you wanted to find out, okay, if I add salt to water, so I add in some salt, does that have, does that increase or decrease the boiling point of water, so the temperature at which the water boils. So in order to do this experiment, you would have the sample that has the salt in it, so water with salt, and then you would have just a sample of water, and it has no salt in it. So this sample of water, just plain water, would be what's called a control. And basically what, it, what that enables you to do is you can compare the two results to each other. So that's what's known as a control. So within biology then as well, so for example, when things like drugs are being uh, tested or uh, to see what kind of effect that they have, a placebo is a control used when testing new medicines. So when they develop a new drug, for example, 
and um, what they often will do is they will have like they will test it on in clinical trials and they will have like two groups of people so one group of people might get a sugar pill but they think they're getting the medicine and another group will actually get the, the new medicine and the idea then is to see like what impact does the placebo have versus the actual medicine that the person is getting and sometimes there can be this thing called the placebo effect where you know a person feels that they're getting better even though they're not even though they haven't been given any medicine it's just um, what's known as a placebo effect so uh, so basically a placebo then it is a substance similar in appearance and taste to the test medicine but has no medical value so in what are called double blind testing neither the tester nor the patient knows what treatment is being given uh, the use of placebos and double blind testing removes what's called bias so a lot of the times what will happen is you have you know so as i say group a get the drug and group b don't get the drug and the only people so if it's what's called a double blind test then that means that so the people that are taking part in the test, they don't know what they're getting. They don't know whether they're getting the placebo or the drug. And then if it's double blind, then the person, the doctors that are administering the drugs, they don't know like whether they're administering the placebo or whether they're administering the actual drug as well. And what this does is it just takes away what's called bias. So sometimes when people get a medicine, they might think, oh yeah, like it's I'm actually feeling better. Um, but this is to remove that and to kind of look at things uh, scientifically. So these are some of the principles of when you're carrying out an experiment, there are some of the principles that need to be taken into account. So here are some of the key points when it comes to when you're carrying out an experiment. And as part of this section, I'm going to get you to carry out an experiment. And these are some of the principles that you would need to take into account when you're when you're doing the experiment. So the first one would be the plan and design. So you need to plan. So you need you, you have a question or something that you're trying to answer. So you need to plan and design the experiment. So what are the steps that you're actually going to carry out when it comes to um, performing the experiment? So be aware of the safety procedures. So again, just when you're carrying out a, uh, a test, always think about safety. So is what are the risks and how do I protect myself from the risks? Uh, the next one is to like to make like selections of your sample. So, for example, if you're testing organisms, is to have like a what's called a random sample. So you also want to use a large enough sample size. So again, you don't want to just do your experiment on one person or one organism. You want to, um, you know, have a big enough population in order to test your hypothesis. So use a control group. So again, you have a control group. Uh, use double blind testing so again double blind testing means like i say they, we don't know who is getting the placebo or who is getting the actual drug change one factor at a time so again you make slight changes so measure changes um, and then when you get all of your data then you want to analyze the results state possible sources of error so for example how are ways that the experiment could go wrong or you could make a mistake and then you want to repeat the experiment so to make sure that it works really well so again this, these are important these uh, 11 principles and these are something that you need to learn and commit to memory in relation to this section of your learning now the scientific method is not perfect it's a fairly good method and it's given us a lot of positive um, improvements and comfort in our life but it's not um, a perfect method so what are some of the limitations of the scientific method so the scientific method is limited by the extent of our scientific knowledge and by our ability to interpret results. So again, um, based on our current understanding of how the world works, um, we can only work within that domain. So as tech, as we start to understand how things work more and more, um, our ideas or the, the theories behind the particular science will start to change as well. So limited knowledge in an area of science, of science reduces the possibility of forming a useful hypothesis. So there are some areas that are very hard to make progress in um, because of our understanding, because of our lack of understanding. So a massive area within science that uh, scientists find very hard to understand is what's called a big problem of consciousness. So for example, you have a brain. So imagine this is your brain. Okay, and your brain is made up of 
atoms. Okay, so your brain is basically matter. Okay, and this matter is able to create this experience that you have every day of consciousness. So for example, you look around the room, you have a visual field, you have everything that's going on in your what's called consciousness. Now, the atoms that make up your brain are very are like they're almost identical, for example, to the atoms that are in a chair. So you have similar atoms, for example, you have carbon atoms, carbon. Atoms that are in the chair and you have carbon atoms that are in your brain. And there's, lot, there's lots of other atoms as well. But basically, when atoms are arranged in this particular configuration, you have what's known as a chair. And as far as we know, a chair is not conscious. But when we arrange atoms in the configuration that they are in, for example, your brain, we get this phenomena of consciousness. So what is the link between, for example, matter or atoms and actual consciousness or your mind or your brain, your, your mind? So this is what's known as a hard problem. So this is an area that not a huge amount of progress has been made because scientists can't explain how atoms give consciousness. And that's, for example, an area that's constantly been developed. Um, but that is an example of how like we don't fully understand how consciousness comes about from brains. Scientists use instruments to measure, make all their measurements and observations. So the quality of the data collected is limited by the accuracy of the instruments that we use. So for example, there was over a period of time, then, so for example, we would have had magnifying glasses at one particular point. And as scientists start to develop lenses, these lenses started to turn into very sophisticated uh, microscopes. And these sophisticated microscopes enabled us to have a look at things like viruses and bacteria, fungi in an awful lot more detail. And because of that detail, we were able to get more knowledge and understanding of how viruses, E. coli and fungi actually work. So again, Instruments, the, the, the constant development of technology and instruments goes hand in hand with um, developing our understanding of how the world works. So not controlling all variables can affect uh, the results of an experiment and lead to incorrect cl conclusions. So again, sometimes experiments can be carried out and mistakes can be made um, it's because it's a human process. So poor experiment, poor experimental design often have uh, non-randomized samples with low sample numbers and no control groups. So again, this can lead to inaccuracies being made in relation to the scientific method. So an example of this is, so back in 1998, so this guy called Andrew Wakefield, so he published results of an investigation in a journal and he was making a claim that the MMR vaccine was linked to autism in children. Uh, the data was later found to be untrustworthy due to the very small non-random sample number of 12 children with no control groups. So this is this like so he basically only like he only used the data from like 12 people. So the MMR autism scandal caused widespread panic and led to the significant drop in vaccine uptake uh, in the years that followed as well. So. Again, this is like a classic example of what's called poor experimentation. And a lot of times this can be done for, um, you know, personal gain, for example, on the side of the particular scientist that's carrying out experimentation like this. So that is the scientific method. So in this, we looked at the areas that are covered within biology. Uh, we talked about the process of the scientific method and we talked about the principles of experimentation. And we also talked about the limitations in the scientific method.